My name is Karen Harrison, and as Ken said, I said he could make up something if he wanted to, but um, I actually am the Executive Director of STEP, Support and Training for Exceptional Parents, and we are the Parent Training Information Center for Tennessee, um, federally funded by the U.S. Department of Education to provide information, training, and support to families who have children with special needs um, to teach them what their children's rights are and what their parents' rights are to get the services that they need through the public education um, system. So um, our, our center deals um, with all the counties in Tennessee, but um, one of the handouts that you have is a map, and every state has a parent training information center like STEP, but just to confuse you, it'll have a different name. So if you go to um, over, I met some folks from Georgia here. Theirs is called PEP, and we're STEP, and everybody just has a different name. But they all provide services to families who have children um, with special needs. So first and foremost, um, even though I'm now the executive director of this organization, I am a parent of a child um, with special needs. And when I was listening this morning, I had um, a journey moment back about 21 years ago. My daughter was born with a very um, extremely rare chromosome disorder. And so I was very excited as I was um, invited to speak at this conference. Um, she has what's called partial trisomy 14Q. So she has an extra piece of 14 on her number six. Um, we, when she was born, um, you know, we, we didn't know that uh, obviously that um, anything was wrong. We were going down the journey of we're going to have a, you know, healthy child, and, and we're very excited about that. And when she, w when I was in uh, labor, she was not breathing correctly, and so they flew us here to Knoxville, here to the University of Tennessee, flew her here, and she had what's called a diaphragmatic hernia. So her intestines were up where her left lung was supposed to be, and they said there's 10% chance she'll live through that surgery, and... Um, but she did. So we thought, oh, yay, we're, we're home free now. And so then uh, they, I was actually recovering in the, um, hall down, in the room, in the hall down from her. And um, they came in and said, we've noticed a few things that are, look a little different with your daughter. And she's got, you know, some facial features that are a little bit different. We want to do some chromosome testing. And so those of you that have had that experience, all of you, um, you know what that what that's like and so it was a very different journey um, so I don't I want to talk to you today uh, about a little, a little bit about my journey but mostly about what your rights are and one of the things that um, a couple things that I want you to take away with you um, even though you might hear some of these things as I was hearing earlier the prognosis that you were given um, we were told that Sarah would never um, sit up she would never walk talk um, she would, we, we should put her in an institution and get on with our lives is what we were told. And so after my husband kicked them in the front yard and said, you need to find a, you know, the exit door quickly, um, we found out that it was a different journey. But um, with high expectations and knowing what your rights are is really going to help you as you do this journey because what, the, what you might be offered um, in education, even early intervention or in the school system, um, might be not sufficient enough to meet the needs that your children have. And so I'm going to teach you some strategies quickly on um, what your rights are and how to work with a team to, um, for high expectations for your children. Okay, does everybody have your handouts now? We're going to go through this workbook. Um, this is a three-hour presentation, so the book that you have uh, typically is three hours. So I'm just going to hit the high points for you. One of the things I'd like to know, how many of you, your children are uh, birth to three? Would you raise your hand? You have families birth to three. Okay, a good number. Um, how about four to six in that age range? Okay, some of you getting ready to, um, you've taken the leap to the public school system and maybe kindergarten that age. Okay, how about um, six through about 12 or so? All right, great. All right. How about uh, 12 and above, 13? 13 and, and on. Okay, one or two families, 13 and above. Okay, so the 13 and above, that's the, the next transition. And as you've already found out in your journey, there's lots of transitions in this um, as you go through. And so the first transition is transitioning from early intervention services, that is the birth through two, and when, you, when your child turns three. Okay. 
All right, so we don't have time to go through all this, but this is one of the takeaways that I'd like you to look at. At the very bottom, this is the intent of IDEA, and this is the law I'm going to talk to you about. It's a federal law, so everything that I'm going to tell you today, um, you, when you go back to your system and your state um, and try to get these services, they can't say, well, that's Tennessee. That's what they do. Um, this is a federal law. And so Congress said um, education can be made more effective by having high expectations in order to meet developmental goals and to the maximum extent possible the challenging expectations that have been established for all children to lead productive and independent adult lives. So when you look at that, the scope of what this law covers, it's any service that your child needs to get ready to live a productive and independent adult life. So it could be um, feeding therapy, it could be swallowing therapy, it could be um, toilet training, it can be a number of things that might not typically um, jump out when your team meets and they'll say, how about if we talk about feeding and swallowing? A lot of times um, those are the discussions that they'll say, maybe you need to have that outside the school system. But those are certainly things that lead toward independent adult lives. So it can certainly be part of what you might expect um, in your educational programs as well. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. One of the things that we try to do is take you from this, the worried, nervous, unsure looking uh, stage to over being more confident and positive. And it is very difficult um, if you have a child with special needs to come in and you're in a whole room full of, of folks and um, to speak up and say what your child needs as you're still going through all of the stages where um, sometimes it's hard to ask for the things that you need um, and recognize that your child needs, um, might need that level of services. So some of the terms that we're going to talk about, and um, how many of you, your children, right at this moment, have an individual education plan or an IEP? Okay, all right, I'm talking to my crowd now. He's a, <laughs> this is my group. Okay, um, I started out by telling you that, um, that when Sarah was born, they said she would never walk, talk, and all of those kind of things. And, and we really just decided that if she, did, if she never walked, that's fine, but it wouldn't be because we didn't get the amount of services that she needed, that we didn't work hard to try to get her what she needed. She also has what's called um, agenesis of the corpus callosum. Anybody know what that is? Okay, a couple of you. So, I, of course, you better raise your hand or, you know, you're going to F. Um. So, anyway, the bridge between the two sides of her brain is totally gone. And so we were, you know, obviously they said there's no way she'll be able to transfer things from left to right and a lot of, a lot of difficulties. So, um, early on, we did some research and found that there was a, a research study in North Carolina that a doctor was working with infants who had agenesis. And... Um, so we went there and got this very specific regimen of things that we were supposed to do every day, tracking things and doing things and all of that. So the good news, I just want to tell you, she, next month she's going to be 22. Um, she didn't say any words at all till she was eight, but she used an augmentative device to talk and sign language. So she had ways to communicate, and that's one of the most important things is whether it's with gestures or pointing to pictures or eye gaze or whatever it might be, finding ways to help help your children communicate. And so, uh, very exciting. If you go, when you go out the door, you'll see a poster there with some pictures of, of Sarah um, to show you just that, um, to have high expectations. And I loved what the one lady said, let your children write their own book. That, that this is their journey and you don't know um, what's possible. IDEA says that the purpose of IDEA is to meet developmental goals and to prepare students um, for life after high school. So you have a right to all of these types of, of services that we're going to get into. Um, one of the most important things is um, which you're, when you're at meetings, you're going to hear all these acronyms. You guys live in the world where there's, there's acronyms. Any of these you recognize in the box? Anybody want to take a shot at some of those for me? Just holler that if you know what UDL is. Anybody know what that is? Universal Design for Learning, good, okay. How about PIS? Positive Behavior Intervention Services. All right, extended school year um, is services through the, through the summer, so most, uh, most of your children would probably um, need to have continued services, not just through the, the months of the school year. And so what would that look like and how to ask for that are some of the things. Um, we're going to move ahead here. Um, for those of you that are in the early processes and haven't been referred to um, yet to the school system, 
um, th this is the process to get an IEP or an individualized education program. So there's the referral written notice and um, the IEP team met meets and determines is there a disability and does the child need special education. So, oh, okay, now we're, <laughs> it's gone. Um, so I'm going I'm to spend more time on the development of the IEP and what are some of your rights in that, in that process. Okay, um, one of the things is getting informed consent. So schools have to get families informed consent before they do any evaluations, unless it's a screening that they do for all the children. So if, there's, if your child's in a kindergarten class and they're doing it, some kind of kindergarten screening for all the children, they wouldn't have to get your permission for that. But if it's anything that's individualized for your child, they have to have your, your consent. And um, very um, important key is that when you get these uh, the evaluation results back, is that you um, ask questions about that if you don't know um, what those things mean that are on that I on the evaluation because those are the things that are, you're going to use to write the goals and then the goals are going to be driving the level of services that you get. So if you have a very um, watered down IEP and you haven't looked at um, social goals, self help goals, safety. Um, speech services, self-help, all of those things are not in your IEP and then you ask for occupational therapy or speech therapy and those types of things. If you haven't written goals that are comprehensive in all of the areas, um, you're not going to be able to get the level of services that you need. So asking a lot of questions. I have um, a friend whose son has autism and um, when she went to the meetings, they would say, Jim continues to perseverate. And she would just shake her head and say, uh-huh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, And just not say any, you know, and not ask what that was. And so she, on the way home, she'd say, I wonder if that's good. Maybe that's bad. I wonder what that means. And so when she finally said, well, tell me exactly what that means and how is it impacting him in school, it was basically that he would get hung up doing one thing, and so he had a hard time with transitions. Any of your children have a hard time transitioning from one thing to the next, right? And so um, if they knew that he was uh, perseverating on something, they needed to do something different. So what they did was come up with a piece. So ask questions if there's things that you don't know. Um, at one of Sarah's uh, earlier IEPs, um, just all of, you know, I saw the list of all the physicians that you might see and the, you know, all of her body parts are affected except for her heart, knock on wood. And so we were seeing all of these various specialists and I thought I knew all of her conditions. And so um, I got this the occupational therapy evaluation back um, and it had a term in it that I didn't know and now the term's going right out of my head. Um, anyway, long story short, um, I asked them what that meant, and it really was that the, the um, tendons in her neck, the muscles in her neck were so tight, I can't remember the term for that. Torticollis, thank you. I should have asked the audience, polled the audience, I should have done that. Uh, Torticollis. So I've never seen that term, and I've seen so many other things about contractures and all of those kind of things. And so they just kind of breezed over that, and it says Sarah continues to have torticollis, yada, yada, yada. I said, what is that? And they explained. I said, well, how does that impact her at school? Does, does she need something to address that? I'm like, no, no, it just means it's really tight. I said, so she would have a hard time if, she, if somebody was trying to throw a ball to her. She couldn't turn her head very much, you know, those kind of things. How does that impact her? We had that discussion. And at the end of all of those questions that I asked, which were a lot, um, she ended up with more occupational therapy to work on, and physical therapy, excuse me, to work on range of motion in her neck and head and those types of things. And so you have to ask the questions and then tie it to how does this impact my child and what will they not be able to do if we don't address this and what could they do if we did address this um, more specifically. Um, every state has to address all of these categories of eligibility. And so, um, and in Tennessee, we have a couple extra that we've added, functionally delayed and intellectually gifted. But these are all the eligibility categories. Um, my daughter is eligible under multiple disabilities because she has um, physical impairments and intellectual delays and those types of things. And so um, the new term, I know you all see mental retardation up there and, and we're um, moving away from that term, but actually in IDEA, the term that it is still in the law is mental retardation. So um, that's why it's still on the screen. So before you boo me or say, that, that's an old term, um, that's the term that is still in IDEA. Um, so um, one of the things that I gave you today is a handout called All About Me. 
And um, I found that this is a very helpful tool that you can use to put what your child's needs are, what, they're, what motivates them, what grabs their attention, what are the things you're concerned about, all of the things in a handy document. And um, from year to year, I would um, update this and give it to everyone if there was a new bus driver, new teacher, um, all of those kind of things. The people that I forgot to forgot as a team to tell anything about Sarah was the cafeteria workers. And so um, one day they were pushing Sarah through the line and they said, do you want more mashed potatoes? And she signed. Do you all know what that is? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, you're awake. So she signed yes. And uh, they don't know what that means. So they evidently, if you can't talk, you must also be deaf. So they said it louder. Do you want more mashed potatoes? Um, <laughs> you know. And she, you know, being compliant, said yes, and they didn't know. So um, then they asked her one more time. Well, the third, she usually gives you about two tries before she um, turns to her father's side of the family and has a nice behavior. And so she then picks up the potatoes and slings them like, okay, you're not going to give me more, you can have mine. And everybody's like, what's going on here? So uh, ding, ding, ding. Um, everybody needs to know how your child communicates, what those signs mean, what those gestures might mean. Um, so that they can be um, involved in that kind of thing, and then you can avoid some of those kind of things. So um, anyway, um, use that document. It actually is online. There's a website there, um, the, the Tennessee um, State Personnel Development Grant. So um, those of you that um, want to fill things out online and you like those online documents, how many of you are kindred spirits to me and you still like a paper and a pencil? Anybody like that? Okay, we got a few people. I mean, I want that paper and I want to write in the margins and I want to draw arrows and all of that kind of thing. But if you want to fill it out online, you can download one and um, you can um, fill it out at will if you want to. Um, the evaluations that the school do, do on your um, child have to be provided in language and form most likely to yield accurate information about what your child knows and can do. Now, most evaluations tell you what? What do they tell you? What they don't know and they can't do, right? Okay, we already know that. We're, we're up to here with what they don't know and can't do. We want to know what they, what they do know and what they can do so we can try to build a plan that will help them to build on those skills. And so um, if your child communicates with signs, gestures, um, an iPad, pictures, whatever it might be, they need to do, use those. Um, there are nonverbal skills that they can use, lots of things like that um, to find out. They have to be sufficiently comprehensive to identify all your children's special education and related needs. Um, whether or not they're com commonly linked to the, to the disability category. And then um, one of my, um, and they should provide relevant information that directly assists the team in determining what the educational needs of the child are. So from those evaluations, you should be able to focus what their education is going to look like. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we're going to skip that for right now. Um, they cannot be racially or culturally biased. They must be given in the child's native language um, and give a complete picture of your child's education. So education is more than reading, writing, and math. It's, it's again, anything your child needs to get uh, prepared for life after school. So um, it is social skills and self-help skills and, and all of those, those types of things. Um, and then the, the bottom one is one of my favorites. Evaluations must be done by a team of professionals, including a specialist in the area of your child's disability. And so um, there's enough information out there. Um, it seems like around um, this particular group of students that you could ask for someone to come to the team that has more um, direct knowledge. Um, and in this day and age, they could join by video conference. Um, so let's say you wanted this fine gentleman to give input to your IEP team about what he's seen, what the possibilities are, what the concerns might be. Um, the school system could video conference him into your, your meeting, and then they would be paying his time to give his input because he's someone that has expertise and a specialist in the area of your child's disability. Um, so a lot of times people are sitting around the table and, and they don't know enough about 
um, your child's needs to give information that's going to help them get to the next level. And so they're saying, let's try this and let's try that. Well, how about if we get someone that knows and we can get them to the table? So it'd be kind of like if um, 10 of you, I said, hey, who wants to, you know, build a bomb this afternoon. Come on up to my room. I don't know how to do it. You probably don't either, but we'll just give it a shot, see what happens. You're not going to get very good results. So you need somebody with some, um, some knowledge and expertise. Yes, ma'am. Right. I'm not considered an expert because I'm a parent. I mean, is that, I'm just trying to, I, for this augmented device, mm -hmm. I want, or her teacher that's been with her for a few years, does that count as this? Like, yeah, any, anybody that, that has enough knowledge to give informed information about what they've seen, how they've seen the child progress or use a device or, you know, any of the data that they might have seen. Um, in using other pieces of equipment, things that didn't work, all of those would be considered more of a specialist than somebody that's just coming in that, that doesn't, um, hasn't interacted with your child. So certainly um, your information as a parent is critical um, in that. And anybody outside therapists that have worked with your children, they can certainly be invited to the IEP team to inform that team. You need a team of people that can um, give the best information possible to write a plan that's going to meet their needs. Um, if the school system, let's just use that as an example, the school system does an AT evaluation um, and you disagree with the evaluation, you can ask for what's called an IEE or an independent educational evaluation by someone that you choose at school expense. Okay, so all you have to do is put in writing, I disagree with the evaluation. You don't have to say why. You just can say, I, you know, I, I disagree. Sometimes they'll ask you why, but IDEA says you don't have to say why. Um, you could just say, I don't think it's comprehensive enough or whatever if you feel, some, some of us feel the need to give that explanation. Um, and the school would need to do an independent evaluation by, by someone else. So there's another piece of information on the table. Um, same thing with speech, speech language, occupational therapy, other evaluations if you disagree. Yes, ma'am. This is federal law, and where you see the citation 300-502, that's going to be in IDEA. You, you, and um, yeah, I was trying to think. If you go to, there's a website on your map. If I can borrow yours real quick here, um, that says where is it? ParentCenterNetwork.org. If you go there. Um, you can pull up IDEA. You can go to our website and pull at the very bottom, 10step.org. It's on your information, too. And um, if you'll put, type in 300.502, it'll take you to this piece of the law. Okay? And I know that there's families from all over, um, all over the country, and I heard there might be some families from Canada here as well. All right, we've got, thank you. Um, who are the Tennessee families? Anybody? One? Okay, great. All right. For, I, I hate to do this, but I will. Um, I, I would love to talk with you all later because I want to hook you up with, I don't know what part of the state you're from, but we have coordinators in Memphis, Nashville, and Greenville that we cover the whole state. So you guys can get individual help with your plans, and the rest of you have to go to the map, call your center, and say, walk me through this, because that's what we're supposed to do. As a parent, I learned my rights when Sarah was two and a half. I went to my first workshop. Um, it was a six-hour <laughs> When the first part of the day was basic rights, the second part was IEP. I had this indoctrination of my rights and went home with my head spinning around on my body saying, really, I could have asked for her to go every day instead of just three days a week for two hours a day, honestly. I, had, I knew she needed it, but I didn't know that I could ask for that or how to go about asking that or how to make that IEP so comprehensive that it would drive that level of services. Um, so connect with your parent centers because that's what we're here for. Um, and in most parent centers, um, a majority of their staff are parents of children with disabilities, so they, they know this process and have been through it. So for Tennessee families, if you'll come up after, I have the parent manual 
that we give to our Tennessee families, and this has federal and state laws in it, sample letters, um, how to request things, those kind of things. This is also available free online for families. If you go to our website, scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a blue book like this, and um, you'll be able to download any of this. It's searchable. It's in a PDF format. So anything that you're concerned about, you can type it in, find out where it's at. And, you know, an IEP is a living document. You can, if you had your meeting and six weeks later you want to call another meeting, absolutely. You can have another meeting to talk about some other things. And for children um, like ours who have lots and lots of um, different in things impacting them, you might want to have an IEP meeting every six to eight weeks anyway to see how what the progress is, what do they need to know, what is the team, how, how are you responding to things um, as you go. Okay, these are some of your procedural safeguards, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about more about those. But this is one of your most powerful um, tools is written notice. And so if you go into the team and you have an outside evaluation maybe that says your child needs a particular service or level of service, and you're having that discussion after you've written the goals and objectives, and the school says, no, we don't provide that in this county. I wish we did, just don't have the money. Okay, can't talk about money at an IEP meeting. It's all about what the child needs. So um, if the team determines the student needs something, then they have to figure out a way to provide that service. So they can't just say no. They have to say no, and here's why. So you can ask them for to give you written notice. And what they have to do in that, anytime they propose or initiate, uh, propose to initiate or change or refuse to initiate or change the identification, evaluation, educational placement, or any other service of your child. They have to tell you the action that was proposed or rejected, why they proposed it or rejected it, um, other options that they considered, what evaluations they used to make that decision, um, any other factors, what your protections are, and where you can go to get assistance in understanding that. Okay, so it's very, very complex. So it can't be no, we don't do that here. Um, so this is something that a lot of times may not just be given. You might have to ask for it, but it's very powerful because then when a lot of times when they have to put it in writing, why, what evaluations did you base it on? Well, we just don't think she needs it. Well, that's not good enough, okay? So a lot of times that, that will cause a change in the team of, to reconsider what you've asked for if they have to put it in writing. This, the school has two choices when you ask for an independent educational evaluation. They can either do it or they can initiate a due process hearing to say they're not going to do it. So it means take you to court to, for a, a hearing officer to say that, they're, that they, don't, they don't need one. And um, I've been doing this 16 years now. Um, two times in Tennessee has that ever happened, that a school would, would not give the independent evaluation. So it's very, very rare. School systems will typically just do the independent evaluation that you've asked for. But they can't just say no. So if they do, just say no. You have to say they have 10 days to either tell you they're going to do it or initiate a hearing. Okay, so look in the manual and get the, get the letter and put it in writing that I'm asking for not just an outside evaluation, but an independent educational evaluation because I disagree with the evaluation that was provided by the school. Um, in special education, terminology is everything. If you don't ask for it in the right way, if you, some things you don't put in writing, it doesn't trigger a timeline. So if I said, I want an IEP meeting to my daughter's special education teacher, she goes, all righty, we'll get around to that. She has as long as she wants to if it's a verbal request. If I ask in writing, she has 14 day, uh, 10 days to give me an IEP meeting. So there's lots and lots of timelines that are triggered by putting something in writing um, that are not triggered by verbal request. So learning, the, learning that is helpful. Yes. And, and again, a lot of times people think special education is a place, and we'll get to that. Special education is not a place, it's a service, and services are portable. So it doesn't mean that just because your child has an IEP, they have to go to a special education classroom or that kind of thing. Special education is a service, not a place. Um, these are some of the people that this is what are called the have to. This is on page 18 in your workbook. These are the people that have to be at an IEP meeting for it to be a legally convened meeting. So if it's just yourself and the special education teacher, you're having a chat. You're not having a meeting. Okay, so you have to have these folks. 
Um, the parents of the child, a regular education teacher, it, the general education teacher is required to be at IEP meetings if the child is going to participate um, in the general education curriculum. And the, the law says that it's presumed the child will participate in some way with typical peers. Um, so you can't just say, well, we don't think that that child's going to be participating with typical peers. So we didn't have a regular education teacher there. The special education teacher, and again, it says of the child. So it can't just be any random regular ed teacher. I see a lot of gym teachers that show up at IEP meetings. And I'm like, uh, is Sarah going to be in your class? No, I just had some time and they sent me down. Uh, well, I'd like to, you know, actually have her first grade teacher here so she might be able to talk to us about how to, um, how Sarah's needs are going to be met in the classroom. And then the school representative, and this is in our state, we call it the LEA representative or um, local education agency representative, but it's the person that signs that they have authority um, to make decisions for the school system. And so I always ask as we're introducing ourselves, who is here that's speaking as the LEA representative for the system? And it doesn't mean they get to make the final decision, but they have to be qualified to provide and supervise specially designed instruction, knowledgeable about the curriculum, and knowledgeable about the availability of resources. So it doesn't mean that they can say, well, we don't have resources to do that, but they have to be knowledgeable if the team decided that the child needed a Dynavox in order to communicate. Um, they could say, oh, we have one of those. We can get that right here. Or they could say, we don't have one of those in the county. We'll have to buy that. So they have to be knowledgeable. Um, one of the things that happens a lot of times is if you don't know who the LEA representative is um, and you don't know that any, whoever says that they're that person has the, that have the authority to sign off on whatever the team decided, you might get to the end of a really great IEP meeting where you have all these services listed and they'll go, oh, we're going to have to check this out with central office before we can approve it. That, that does, that's not how it's supposed to go. Whoever said they were the LEA representative um, is there to, and they, are, they have the authority to allocate the school's resources. So make sure you know who that person is at your meeting. Um, and then these are the add-on people that can, can come. Um, the evaluation or someone that can interpret the um, implications of the evaluation. A lot of times um, someone will be there and they're not the evaluator. They just send somebody that is going to explain that to you. If you want the actual evaluator there, um, you need to ask for that. Just to have specific questions that I don't think someone's going to be able to answer um, that wasn't there. So how was my child acting that day? Were they, you know, were they attentive? All, all of those things that the evaluator can tell you that maybe the report can't. Um, the, the school can, and the teacher, the school and the family can invite anyone else. These are the other individuals who have knowledge or expertise concerning the child, including related service personnel. So that's speech therapy, language therapist, occupational therapist, um, all of those types of things. So you guys as parents can bring anybody with you that you want to to the team. Um, the school can only bring people who have knowledge or special expertise regarding your child. So you shouldn't see school board attorneys at your IEP meeting because they have knowledge of IDEA and the law, but not a knowledge and expertise regarding your child. So keep that um, in mind as you go along. And then um, the child can be present wherever appropriate. Um, at age 16, students have to be invited to come to their meeting. And we've had some students that have been invited and said, I don't want to go. Um, we've had some students that joined by conference call from another room because it's too intimidating for them to come into the room. But they have to at least be invited to participate um, at age 16 because it's, it's about them and what they want. So, um, you know, I get a lot of questions about should I take my child to the meeting, shouldn't I take my child to the meeting. Um, my daughter would always sign I love you to everybody and try to rub their back and so she was a very positive, you know, she brought the love into the room. Um, but also it helped the team, I think, focus on this is the child we're talking about today. Um, and so a lot of people come into the meetings with um, lots of baggage, lots of things, that worries about other things. So at least a picture of your child on the table. Um, if, you're, if your child's not going to stay the whole time, 
um, just so that team knows that we're focusing on this child today can be very helpful. But that's a parent's decision. Um, it takes time to develop an IEP, and these are all the things that you have to talk about at an IEP team meeting. So if you have a school system and they're giving you 30 minutes for an IEP meeting or an hour, um, if you know that you're going to have to talk about a number of things, when you write your request for the meeting, put please allow two hours and please invite these people to be in attendance. That's going to help get the right people there and give you enough time to discuss the issues that you need to discuss. Otherwise, you're going to have this never-ending IEP team meeting um, that you don't have enough time to discuss everything, and so um, you can't get the services in place that your child needs. Okay, um, the IEP contains all of these um, things that we're talking about, um, and I don't have time to go into all of this because of the, the, the shortness of the hour, but um, the IEP has to be very, very specific and, and should include um, everything as, as not just academics, but non-academics, extracurricular activities, anything that other children in the school are having access to your child has a right to participate in those things as well. So if there's after school clubs, if there's um, any kind of activities, after school field trips, those types of things, the school has to provide, um, not only let them go, but provide serve, um, support so that they can go. So a lot of times, um, as Sarah was going through the system and other families that we've worked with, um, maybe children that have um, fragile medical conditions, um, or behavior issues, they would say, well, they can go, but you have to go with them. That would be right where it crosses the line of 504. That's discrimination to say everybody can go, but your child, unless your parent, you go with them. So they have to provide if they need a nurse to go on a field trip because that's the only way your child could be safe, then the nurse has to go and the school has to provide that. If they need a one-on-one -on -one assistant to go to meet your child's needs, um, that has to be provided. Otherwise, they're discriminating against your child. Yes? Okay. Yes, they have a right to participate in anything that, that is available and offered to any child in that school. And so if, if they need support to be part of that, then... Um, the, the team has to talk about what support do they need to be able to be included in that. Yes. Okay, and I've got a slide in here about literacy in the IEP because a lot of times children um, that have health needs and other types of needs, um, they are, we're a lot of times focusing on functional skills and we forget about literacy skills and all of those types of things and certainly that's very important as well. Um, these are the things that have to be talked about in the IEP. Um, and so I'm just going to hit these very quickly. They're called special factors, and usually on the first page or second page of your IEP, it'll say, did the team consider limited English proficiency, yes or no? Is the child blind or have a visual impairment? Do they have communication needs? Do they have assistive technology needs? And do they have behavior needs? And many times, those are already checked before you get there. They, these are all team discussions. Everything at the, at the table, the parents have a right and need to participate in. So if you looked at your child's IEP today, and it says, does a child need assistive technology in order to benefit from their education? And it's been checked no, but nobody ever talked to you about that, and there's never been an assistive technology evaluation done, then something was skipped, okay? So you might want to go back and say, that how do we know if they need assistive technology if we never have, have evaluated that? Um, if they have behavior needs, you have to talk about, yes, they do, and what are we going to do to address that? And communication needs the same. So um, make sure you're part of all of those discussions. When you go back and look at your IEPs, if you weren't part of that discussion, go back at your next meeting and say, let's, let's revisit the, one of these areas um, as well. Um, present levels of performance um, are critical that they be accurate. Um, present levels of performance, if you don't know where, where your child's functioning in every area um, presently, it's going to be hard to write where you want them to be a year from now. And um, the law requires that the IEP not only give, a, give you a number, let's say that they're functioning um, at a three-year, three two-month level on some particular skill, but that it gives descriptive information. So the, the child can um, answer a question 
about a story that's read to them, but they cannot read the story themselves. Or they can read the story but cannot answer comprehension questions. Or whatever it might be, you need some language around that. So I call it, um, it needs to be an IEP and a snapshot. So if I picked up any of your children's IEPs and I read the present levels of performance, I would have a really clear picture of your, what your child's needs are, how they're functioning socially, academically, um, in, uh, in every area. Um, self-help skills, all of that. So if you just have numbers, um, ask that to be defined a little bit further because that's where you're going to write those goals. So children have a right to make a year's worth of progress for a year's worth of education. And for some children, if they make two months of progress for a year, that, that's going to be considered cons um, significant. But you don't want to have watered down IEP goals. Okay. Um, Measurable annual goals, we don't have time to go into all of that. That You have to have um, a report of progress at least as frequently as every other child in the system. So if your school gives progress reports every three weeks, you should be getting something every three weeks with the progress on your child's IEP. If they give six weeks reports or grade cards or nine weeks, whatever that word is, that's when you should be getting updates on your child's goals and objectives. And um, you know, it would take a long time for me to go into the IEP. We have a whole three-hour workshop just on understanding the IEP document. But if you've written goals and you're halfway through the school year and if you keep getting that little number two, it says uh, 2B, that means very little progress made, more time needed, or a 3B, some progress made, more time needed, more time needed, more time needed, but you're never getting a 4. Anybody know what a 4 is? What's achieved, right? Goal has been met. So easy, just a quick easy way for you to look at your child's reports of progress. When you get them and you see a 4, you go, yes, they mastered something. If you get them and it keeps saying 2, 2, 2, or 3, 3, 3 all year long, um, it's not rocket science. Unless you change something, they're not going to master that goal. So you want to go back to the meeting and say, listen, it just says more time needed, more time needed, more time needed. How much time is enough time to, to master this goal? Maybe we want to try a different intervention. And so that's a really good indicator that if you've been asking for maybe a different type of intervention or more services, if you have an IEP that doesn't show those number fours, um, you don't want to have that same IEP next year. You have a right to master those goals and move, to, move on to new ones the next school year. So um, in increasing services, changing a service, all of those things, if you look at that report of progress. Um, so spend some time looking, looking at that report of progress and what does that mean and how can you use that to get the services that your child needs. Um, the IEP has to have all program modifications and supports for school personnel. This is one of my favorite pieces um, that, that was written in um, and, and increased in 2004 is not only what does the child need, but what does the teacher need to be able to support your child. So if they have no knowledge about your child's um, specific disability, maybe they need some training about that, um, that type of thing. Um, whatever it is that they might need. Um, that could be they need an extra set of hands in the classroom. Okay, um, We had one student with autism and he was a runner and he was going into kindergarten and we were asking at the meeting for a one-on-one -on -one aid. And they said, no, the teacher can handle it. Yeah, there's 18 children, he's going to make 19. I said, okay, let me just ask you a hypothetical question. Let's say John runs out the door. Is the teacher going to go after him and leave the other 18 children by themselves? Or is she just going to let John run because she has 18 kindergartners that need her attention? That changed the conversation. They're like, oh, well, you know, we have to think about that. But that's the other thing. If your child's receiving services, no matter what the setting is, if they need to be redirected or someone needs to be watching to see if there's some, um, signs of a seizure coming on, who's paying attention to that? If you have a classroom full of kids and one teacher and one aide, um, lots of things can happen, particularly kids with um, special health care needs. And so think about those are the ways that you can introduce those discussions um, into the IEP team and, and beef up the level of support that your child's going to get in the school system. Okay. Um, literacy, again, literacy is a broad term. I'm, I've got to wrap this up. Um, but we, have, we actually have some information there um, in your packet about um, literacy. But one of the things that is important is that 
Um, schools are required to use peer-reviewed and research-based instruction for your children, not just for reading, but for everything that they're doing with your children. IDEA requires that they, they use research-based instruction. So if they're trying to teach your children um, language or how, to, or how to talk, and they can't give you the research behind why they're using a particular method, um, then that's a good question. You can say, I need to know what method you're using and how did you choose that for my child? Well, that's what we use with all the children. Yeah, but that wasn't my question. My question is, is it peer-reviewed? Is it research-based? Um, that Those are some of the things that bring the IEP level up to what it needs to be so that our children can make the progress that they need to make. Uh, related services, your child has a right to have all of the supports and services they need to benefit once you've written this really great IEP and you have all the goals written, what you want them to be, um, what supports are they going to need. And this is where sometimes um, things come in, into play. Oops, what happened there? Did I turn this off? Oh, there we go. Okay, just playing with you there. Um, all of these are related services that are required by the school system. I want to jump down to, you see medical services, diagnosing and evaluating. So um, sometimes at an, at a team will say, we think something else is going on with Sue, but we're not really sure. I think it might be a processing thing. It might be hearing. It might be something else. If the school acknowledges that, um, then they have to do the evaluation. They have to pay for the evaluation to be done, even if it is something medical at that point. Um, because it might impact their education. And so um, not for anything else, but for anything regarding, regarding diagnosing and evaluating, the school system would be obligated. So a lot of times we'll, say, we'll hear a school say, we think there's something neurological going on that you know, we're noticing a few different things. So if you'll take them to the neurologist and then bring that report back, um, we'd like to consider that. Well, I want you to consider who you're going to send them to and um, how you're going to pay for that, because that is part of it. Counseling services, social work services, recreation and um, therapeutic recreation. A lot of our time, so our children need special things in order to be able to participate with their peers on the playground and um, in the classrooms and all of those kind of things. So you could ask for a recreational therapy evaluation as well. So I'm going to just kind of wrap this up, assistive technology. Um, you have in your book all of these. It's much more information than, than I can cover in one, um, in one session. That's my daughter, actually. Um, that's Sarah hugging uh, Cody's neck off. If you have to dance tonight, because I would be all right to bring her. You're probably going to get some background. Um, she loves long hair, so those of you that have long hair, and, and she loves um, men that are bald or have beards. So, um, <laughs> so she's, if you have a beard, she's going to rub your face. I apologize in advance. It's going to happen. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying um, there's lots of other things that I, that I would love to cover with you guys and share um, more about your rights. But just um, knowing that being an active participant in your child's um, planning process, um, a lot of times... If you are not getting the responses that you need, you can take a tape recorder to the meeting and say, I'm sorry, my husband couldn't be here today. I want to record this so that um, he can listen to it later. Um, it, sometimes that changes the discussion if you're having difficulty getting things that you need. <laughs> you can see why that might be, right? Um, so anyway, in the back are some tips about IEP meetings and how to conduct them and, how, and questions you can ask. And that's one of them is, you know, taking the tape recorder. I usually just say, I'm sure you don't mind if I re record this. Um, a lot of times the school will then get out their recorder. That's fine, too. You know, let's all record. That's fine. <laughs> it's, it's good. Okay. I wish I could spend all day and answer all your questions. It would be um, great fun. I am going to be around through the lunch hour, um, so if you have questions and um, those kind of things, we do have on our website, we have several um, YouTube videos about um, IEP meetings. We have some mock IEP meetings um, on there, so you can watch those scenarios. And you can, anybody can check out our training DVDs. There's a three-hour DVD of me doing the three-hour version of this with a lot more bells and whistles to it. Um, and certainly you can contact us um, by email. All of that information is, is in your packet.